President Kagame, in your Vision 2020, you have laid out ambitious plans you have for your country. As business people, however, we know it's the quality of the team and its motivation and teamwork which determines whether those plans can be made into reality. Can you let us know a little bit about your government team, how you built it, and your management style as a country leader? Well, thank you. First, uh, our government team is composed uh, of both young men and women, well, and old men and women, but there are many of them who are still young, energetic, and uh, have acquired skills and knowledge over the years in different professions and lived in different parts of the world. And we have had the opportunity to have them uh, willing to come and serve the country, and this is how we select them on the basis of their capabilities and commitment and this background where they can serve in different places. But they come with the full understanding that there is high expectation on their performance and therefore results. This is how we work in the country at different levels, whether at the cabinet level or other levels, including the local administration level, the local government. We have leaders who we expect to be able to do what they are supposed to do, and we evaluate them on the basis of how they are performing, as well as the results in the end, given the targets that have been set. So the management style, if you will, is that of involving not only the leaders, but those who are led. The second is to be able to communicate frankly with each other and say this is what is expected of us, and therefore we must be able to be measured on the results, and that's what we should not expect. So there is a frank, direct conversation about the expectations, about how of the people we serve, and about how we go about our businesses. So there is if you will, very not so much room in terms of wasting so much time and people feeling they're entitled to this and that, there is a process of accountability that is uphold and that must be seen to be implemented. This is how we carry out our job. You sound like a CEO more than a politician, and that's a compliment. <laughs> Uh, John, you've been working closely, as the video showed, with Liberia, with President Johnson Sirleaf and her team of ministers. What has been your experience working with the government of Liberia, and what advice would you have for YPOers working with governments in Africa? I think that our experience has been overall positive. I think the really tough thing, and you must feel for the president of Liberia, is there's a lack of capacity. So there's a few good ministers as the president and she's trying to build the team, but it's very difficult. And I think the dif most difficult thing for Western entrepreneurs coming to a country like Liberia is that the second step after the meeting of getting things done is very difficult because there's a lack of capacity, a lack of education and other issues in the government below that. So that's been the tough part. My advice, I think, to YPOers is then you sort of have to compromise in some ways. I think you want to follow the general path that the government has outlined in their policies because you're not there as a, as a foreigner to try to change government policy. You're trying to support what the government's doing. But at the same time, maintain your own independent path. So you maintain your own principles. You maintain your own way of getting things done, your own action orientation. And don't be discouraged by a lack of capacity in the government. Don't let it become a lack of capacity in your own company. Well, let me follow up directly with another question. When in considering engaging in a developing country, uh, everyone is afraid of handling corruption should that come up. What has been your experience with corruption, and how have you or your organization handled it in Liberia? Well, corruption is a major issue, I think, in, in many African and many developing countries and many countries in the world. Um, obviously, um, one of our first mantras is do no harm. So obviously, we're not involved in any corruption, and obviously, have a whole team and a whole policy on that. Uh, there was a sort of almost a funny story where the, there was a really lack of education in the Liberian part. One of the members of parliament came to one of our managers and said, 
you know, for $25,000, this power bill can go through very easily. And of course, our manager says, no, we can't take any money, just, you know. So two weeks later, the guy called back and said, uh, how about $10,000? <laughs> and we said, no, you didn't understand the principle. <laughs> it's a principle of it. So I think it's a tough thing. It's a matter of education, I find. It's, uh, you've had people in, in Liberia's case, and I guess in Rwanda's as well, have gone through a life and death civil war experience. So, you know, personal survival was, was, was the most and ultimate thing. I think we're moving now in Liberia, and obviously Rwanda's moved on from this into a society where people are looking and see a future, and hence when they see a future, they see the society is not served by corruption. Mm -hmm. and corruption is a, and it, I guess thirdly, it does delay things. You know, by not paying, it takes longer, but we think it's the right thing to do. Oh, I would like to get uh, President Kagame's view on that. Uh, President Kagame, you've heard John's experience with governments and corruption in Africa. How would you respond to him? And what have you done to eradicate corruption in your government? And to what extent have you succeeded? Well, it's, it's very clear there is corruption in many parts of, of the continent of Africa and beyond, as has been said. Corruption is not specific an African thing. It's, it's a global issue, but it has affected Africa more because there is a lot to do. And if you allow corruption to take root, Corruption becomes an industry in itself and, and, and consumes every resource and nothing goes for development or making the change that people want. So what we have done in our case, we have made a very clear statement and to everyone and this is something that is on everybody's mind and it's in everybody's language that we must fight corruption. But that alone is not enough. We need to build institutions. We need to, that will help fight corruption and make sure that at different levels of accountability, this question is answered. And certainly it is not a very easy thing because some of the people who are involved in this corruption in their own countries sometimes are powerful people. There are people with certain authority, some of it given by elective offices that they hold and so on and so forth. But if at the top you don't allow it, because the, the biggest problem is if at the top level it is allowed or practiced, then it spreads very quickly to the other re levels. But if at the top there is not compromising on this issue of corruption and you are seen to be fighting corruption and the demand that others do it at different levels, in the end, you s begin to see results. And in places where some, even on one hand, people are talking about fighting corruption and you continue to see it, it is because they talk about fighting it, but they don't end up actually, or if they follow through the commitment to fight against corruption, you find it is only the small, the, you know, at the lower levels. The, the ordinary people really who maybe have got involved in uh, petty, petty corruption are the ones who are penalized or punished at the top, the big level, at, at the big, men and women who are involved in this get away with it. So in our case, we have been steadfast and firm on saying everybody will be held accountable and we have set up institutions that we want to see follow through this commitment and are seen to hold accountable whether they are public servants or even with engagement of civil society, we find even in the private sector, they are beginning to be responsive in terms of uh, understanding that f corruption is not good for the economy, it's not good for the politics of the country, and they facilitate the, that fight. And there is, even in the recent uh, a survey that was carried out by Transparency International, which came you know, and 
carried out that survey across the country, they identified that actually the fight is succeeding. We were making very good progress. And on the continent, Rwanda comes at the top in terms of transparency and accountability and holding people. So really, it takes root. And the general population, the society, doesn't accept corruption. Only when they are driven into it, and it is on the way of life, the way of survival, then they get involved. But if you engage them in a fight against it, they come along and they make it succeed. Mr. Can I maybe just one quick thing is that you know, it takes two to tango. So there's the, in some African countries we're talking about, there is corruption, but it's not African companies that are giving the money. <laughs> it's Western companies and it's other ones. So I think we have to look back on what we can do as a developed society to make sure our companies are acting responsibly. I think US, not, not American, but the US law on foreign corrupt practices law is probably a good idea. It's, you know, if the governments like um, the ones in Rwanda are trying to rein in the recipients, we also have an equal duty to rein in the donors. And it's absolutely vital for, the, for entrepreneurial enterprise to blossom anywhere. There has to be a sense of a level playing field. Yeah. Um, John, you've been engaged in both charity projects and investments in Liberia. Uh, which do you consider more important for a developing country? And how does social enterprise fit in the, in the whole spectrum? Well, you know, there's sort of, we look at it theoretically for a second, there's sort of the relief of human suffering, which clearly is a worthy task. And that, I think, is clearly best set out by, by uh, charitable and donat donated gifts. On the other hand, there's being an agent of social change. And that's where it's more difficult. We found that non-sustainable, continuous donations are not going to be a social change. They'll be a continuing problem. For example, when we were looking at the healthcare sector, and we were doing a lot of work with uh, maternal mortality issues in uh, Liberia, when we're looking at the hospital budgets, you see 20, 30, 40% are power. You know, diesel fuel, replacing the diesel generators, et cetera. There's where we said we can give an indirect donation to every hospital within the Monrovia area by having a centralized power plant upon which we'll make money by creating an enterprise to produce green power. So there's a good example where, where the actual the healthcare system was helped by a social enterprise, by us reducing their cost of electricity, making it more efficient, making it more, more reliable. And that's what our project will be doing. So I think that as you move into agents of social change, and over the long term, as countries develop, they can't depend on handouts. And I think that social enterprise is that, I'd say, that intermediate step towards um, this pure private enterprise. What we're trying to do in Liberia is we want to make sure that our project provides electricity, a uh, good price, is carbon neutral but also makes an acceptable return so that we can say, look, to other countries, to other companies who will then come into Liberia. And similarly in Rwanda, they want the companies to make money such that they'll bring in others. And if the social enterprise is the one that takes the first risk, we consider ourselves the catalyst entrepreneurs, catalyst social entrepreneurs, that's okay. We'll take more risk, we'll do work harder, but hopefully make a return that's acceptable so the new and the future um, private enterprise can come in purely and have broken that barrier to show that there is a private enterprise possible in these countries. 